Well, good evening and welcome. We're talking history on News Talk 106 to 108 with me, Patrick Gagan. And in tonight's show, we're looking at the history of Cromwell in Ireland, a nine month period that led to him being viewed by some as the devil incarnate, a war criminal, and one of the greatest villains in Irish history. Don't forget, if you want to comment on any of our items, you can text the show at any time on 53106. That's for 30 cent. You can call us on our local 1890 number, 453106, or you can email us at talkinghistory at newstalk.ie. Last week, we looked at the history of the American Civil War, and in particular, the involvement of the Irish Americans on this, the 150th anniversary of the start of the war. And if you want to listen to this or some of our older shows, just go to our website newstalk.ie or go directly to iTunes In tonight's debate we're looking at the history of Cromwell in Ireland On the 15th of August 1649 Oliver Cromwell landed at Ringsend near Dublin following his appointment as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland and General of the Army Less than a month later, on the 11th and 12th of September, Drogheda fell to his forces and his troops killed an estimated 3,000 royalist troops, all the Catholic clergy he could identify and an unknown number of civilians. This was followed by the capture of Wexford on the 11th of October, where more than 2,000 were slaughtered and the fall of New Ross eight days later. As Michal Ashukru explains in the introduction to his recent groundbreaking study, God's Executioner, Oliver Cromwell and the Conquest of Ireland, the massacre of thousands of soldiers and civilians by the new model army at both Drogheda and Wexford must rank among the greatest atrocities in Anglo-Irish history, although he accepts that the full extent of the slaughter is still a source of controversy. John Morrill, in the Dictionary of Irish Biography, describes Drogheda as Cromwell's Hiroshima and Wexford as his Nagasaki, but recognises that these massacres did not bring an end to the war, only to atrocity. On the 26th of May 1650, Cromwell departed from Ireland, leaving his son-in-law, Henry Ireton, in charge. In total, Cromwell only spent nine months in Ireland, but it was one of the most significant periods of Irish history and left a long and bitter legacy. So in tonight's show, we want to look back over that nine-month period and find out what really happened and whether Cromwell deserves his reputation as one of the greatest villains in Irish history. And to help me do this, I'm delighted to welcome our panel of experts. Dr. Michal Ashukru lectures in the Department of History at Trinity College Dublin and is the author of God's Executioner, Oliver Cromwell and the Conquest of Ireland. He's currently working with John Morrill on a four-volume definitive collection of Cromwell's letters and papers, which will be published by Oxford University Press. John Morrill is Professor of British Art and Irish History at the University of Cambridge, and he's the author of numerous works, including Oliver Cromwell, published by Oxford University Press in 2007. Dr. Eamon O'Kira is Senior Lecturer in Irish and English Literary and Historical Studies at the University of Ulster, and is currently Gast Professor or Visiting Professor at the University of Saarland for this academic year. He was on the show just a few weeks ago, talking about his latest publication, an edited collection of essays on the flight of the Earls. Well, you're all very welcome. And later in the show, we'll be joined by Senator Joe O'Toole, the independent member of Shannon Aaron, who represents NUI, and the former president of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions. Well, Michal, maybe we could start with you and maybe you could maybe give us some context about what was Ireland like in 1649 and why did Oliver Cromwell feel he had to come to Ireland? Well, Patrick, I think uh, the most important thing is that uh, to acknowledge that when Cromwell arrives in 1649, it, it's really sort of uh, in the midst of a war that has been going on for over eight years. Uh, and the country has already suffered uh, an awful lot. It begins uh, in 1641 uh, with a rebellion by... Um, Catholic gentry in Ulster, uh, for limited means, they're trying to prevent a further erosion of their of their status. But what it does is it triggers a nationwide uprising uh, involving all the people of Ireland, uh, and most infamously, of course, leads to uh, a number of massacres uh, and atrocities. Uh, and uh, shortly after that, uh, the Catholic Irish gentry and clergy managed to come together to create the uh, Confederate Association based in Kilkenny, which for the next seven years or so really effectively is the government of 
most of Ireland. But in the midst of this, there is a war going on, an incredibly complex war involving a number of different armies. We have the Catholic forces. We have uh, forces uh, that are still loyal to the king, Charles I. We've got uh, armies that are loyal to the English Parliament and then Scottish forces as well. So it's an incredibly complex conflict uh, that causes widespread destruction, uh, death and mayhem throughout the country. And so it's into the midst of this mayhem that Oliver Cromwell himself arrives in 1649. And John, we also have in this time, in 1649, the execution of the king, Charles I. That's right. Um, I mean, Charles I was um, king of Ireland as well as um, Britain, of course. (coughs) And he played a very active part in the 1640s in trying to bring um, Irish Catholic troops from Ireland to help him win the Civil War in England. So, so that that had been a major part in his downfall, a willingness to use uh, to his Irish troops in England following uh, the alleged massacres of 1641 and 1642. So Cromwell certainly believed when he came over that he had to um, uh, avenge the massacres of a few years earlier and make sure that Ireland could no longer be a threat to the Protestant English state. And Eamon, when you look then at Cromwell arriving in Ireland in, in August 1649, how would we describe the mission? Is it to, to, to get revenge for what they believe that happened in 1641? Is it, is it, is it part of what Michal was talking about, the wider conflict? Is it to get lands for his troops? How should we view it? I think if Cromwell arrives into, as, as, as Michal, as Michal um, pointed out, Cromwell arrives into, you know, what is a, a political and military maelstrom. He's leading, he's leading probably the best army in the three kingdoms at that particular time. And as the Duke of Ormond famously said, I don't fear Cromwell, I fear his purse because this army was bankrolled by the city of London who's, uh, who, who had, had, um, thrown its considerable political and and financial might behind the parliamentary war effort. So Cromwell is arriving with a huge army. It's a it's a it's a it's an army. It's a it's a it's an army that in which religion and and Puritan, particularly of a, of a of a distinctly Puritan strain, plays a leading role. And um, it's an it's an army that had been fed on the lurid, um, almost pornographic tales of of um, Catholic atrocities against the innocent um, innocent Protestants, and I suppose with the with the the the, the words of John Milton ringing in their ears, "Revenge, O Lord, the slaughter of the saints." So this was an army on a mission to extract revenge for. Um, what was perceived as as a as a Catholic massacre of you know three to six hundred thousand um, um, Protestants, which, of which by, by the time reports had made their way and circulated through the I suppose a, a, a popular media, so it's an army on a mission to conquer Ireland and to avenge Catholic atrocity. And of course, Michal, you and John are, are, are some of the people along Jane Olmar and others, Aidan Clark, with that 1641 depositions project to to make those sources available to the public now. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a project that's just finished, actually, Patrick. Um, it's gone on for the last three years uh, um, and what uh, we had a wonderful team that actually transcribed the entire collection. It runs into over 30 volumes of, of these witness statements from 1641, 42, uh, and indeed right throughout uh, that decade in the 1650s. Uh, and they gave uh, you know, incredibly detailed uh, accounts of their lives at the time, but also of, of what happened to them um, during the, the early days of the Rising. Uh, and as Eamon pointed out, uh, one of the, the, the key issues about the, the evidence from these depositions was that the number of people who were actually killed. Uh, and of course, this was grossly exaggerated by the time uh, it arrived over to England. And we know that Cromwell himself was uh, aware of these accounts and reading them, uh, and therefore was, was very much of the mind that this had to be avenged at some time. But if I could just go back, I think one of the things before we get too kind of caught up in the in the, the whole issue of, of, of massacres and, and revenge etc is that the the um, English Parliament really had no option here they had raised an enormous sum of money at the very beginning of the English Civil War uh, which would they the only way they could pay back was uh, through um, confiscated Irish land so in a sense uh, as soon as they could uh, sort sort out the situation in England once which they did with the execution of of, of Charles I uh, in uh, January 1649 
they immediately turn their attention to Ireland uh, and, and there's very sort of specific economic reasons for this as well as the propaganda uh, uh, mission that, that uh, both John and, and Eamon have talked about here. There were very sort of base sort of economic motives behind this invasion as well. And John, I'd love to put to you a text from one of our listeners, a very good text from Richard in Cork on 53106, because he's, he's, he says that it's very disappointing to hear Cromwell being portrayed so negatively on News Talk. Well, that's from me. And he says that Cromwell is rightly regarded as one of Britain's greatest parliamentarians. Indeed, we could do with his like now to knock the country into shape. What about that? Because in a way, there's always been that split between maybe how he's viewed by, by nationalists in Ireland and how he's viewed by some people in, in Britain who see him as, a, as, as Richard says, a great parliamentarian. So, so have I been too negative uh, towards Cromwell? Well, it's a question of whether he behaved differently in Ireland from how he behaved in England. I think the answer to that is very broadly he, he did, um, and he behaved in Scotland somewhere in between. But I mean, it is important that by now he's an extremely hardened and seasoned soldier. And of course, if you fight battle after battle in a close encounter, you're going to see a lot of people um, dying in front of you. And you're, you are coarsened by the experience of close encounter warfare over several years. And he does come to Ireland, I think, with that coarsening effect. But as far as him as a politician is concerned, I mean, yes, he was um, radically committed to the view that uh, uh, that the um, Britain in particular had been under tyranny for m- many years, a tyranny of a, of a king who disregarded the liberties of his people, um, didn't, use, didn't, didn't observe the rule of law, uh, a king who had taken money without uh, proper parliamentary consent, and above all, a king who had imposed his own preferred style of of religion on his people and he was he believed he should overthrow tyranny in its all its forms and establish liberty in its all its forms and he is a passionate believer in liberty and we, I hope later on we might look at some of the ways in which he believes in extending liberty to Ireland um, liberty following conquest certainly but a, a, a conquest that could create the conditions of liberty and that's a, that's a kind of tough um, um, thing to kind of sort through but in England uh, he's still remembered very much as, as a kind of extraordinary believer not only in religious liberty but religious equality that those who weren't members of the state church should have equal political rights and he believed in setting up a political system that would protect intellectual and and personal religious liberty so for many people in England he is a hero he's one of the very few Englishmen to have a society dedicated to his memory which you know lays a wreath of his statue every year but remembers above all that his his, um, commitment to political and religious freedom Uh, it doesn't mean to say he extends that everywhere he goes, but within England, he can be um, reasonably portrayed as a champion of liberty. Uh, John, if I could just uh, come in here and say, I mean, it's it's an interesting uh, point as you raise here because, I mean, there were people in England uh, prior to the invasion in 1649 that actually made the case that, you know, this tyranny uh, of English rule in Ireland, if you like, and that the English really had no had no place going to Ireland at all uh, and should just allow the Irish to, to sort out their own affairs. I mean, do we get any evidence that, that Cromwell, if you like, was, was aware of those sort of arguments uh, and, and if so, what he made of them? Well, the, before he came to Ireland, he had to uh, um, get assemble the army. Um, he had the, the there was a there was a way in which uh, regiments to serve in Ireland were chosen by lot. There was a lottery, and the regiments to go were chosen by lottery, and one or two of them refused to go. Um, and that was partly because English armies tended not to come back from Ireland. They, you know, they came, or if they came back, they came back uh, uh, enormously reduced in numbers. But it's also because there was uh, there was a lack of of real commitment. To, to that war. And Cromwell actually has a meeting in Hyde Park in central London where he harangues the troops who are refusing to go and then, and then debates with, with a, um, a common soldier who put the case against going to Ireland. And at the end of the debate, he then turns to the soldiers and says, those who are willing to serve with me step forward. Those who don't wish to go, you know, stay in their place. And everybody stepped forward. So there is a very dramatic moment um, in the spring of 1649 when... Uh, when the, he must have been aware that some troops were unhappy about the campaign, but, he, but at least as far as those that publicly identified themselves as being against it, he did persuade them.
Okay, well, you're listening to Talking History on News Talk, and tonight we're looking at the story, the history of Cromwell in Ireland. Loads of texts coming in on 53106 from those who say that uh, the Irish should recognise the intellectual strengths of Cromwell to those who believe, like Connor on the bus, that uh, it was the best thing for him to, to do to try and unite his factions by having an Irish invasion that, uh, in, in other words, it was, a, it was a pragmatic or cynical reason that brought him to Ireland. To others like Pat in Dublin, who heard that show, our second ever show, back in October 2007 when he was driving home from Cork and has listened to the show ever since and uh, he's surprised that whenever he goes to Wexford he notices that there aren't very many mentions of Cromwell in, in, in songs there and that surprised him so that's maybe something that we might look at later when we look at the legacy of Cromwell and the, the, legacy, the, hit, the legacy of him in the various histories but coming up after the break we're going to be finding out what really happened in Drogheda and Wexford and I suppose looking at those two great uh, incidents which established his reputation for being a monster in Irish history. So stay with us on News Talk. Talking History with Patrick Gagan. Thanks to IrishNewspaperArchives.com. History online and in your library. On News Talk 106 to 108. Well, welcome back to Talking History. And tonight, well, we're looking at the story of Cromwell in Ireland. And on the panel, we have Dr. Michal Shukru, uh, Professor John Morrill and Dr. Eamon O'Kira. And we're soon to be joined by Senator Joe O'Toole. But, Michal, can we talk then about, about Drogheda, I suppose, first of all? Because that's the first thing that helps create that image of him as a monster. And there's a quote from him at the time that this was a righteous judgment of God upon those barbarous wretches and because they had on their hands so much innocent blood. And there does seem to be a, a, a vengeful fury with him. But I suppose it's not really... Well, I suppose talk us through maybe what happened in Drogheda. Well, I think, you know, you're right. Uh, Cromwell is very much associated with Drogheda. When you mention him uh, in Ireland at all, it's almost certainly in, in, in the context of Drogheda. And this is his first major military engagement after his arrival um, in Ireland it takes place uh, in September and he arrives, of course, in August. Uh, and he needs a quick victory. Uh, he needs a quick victory. He's arrived over, um, as John has said there. I mean, the campaign was not universally popular uh, um, with with the army, uh, and also the the regime in England was was uh, not particularly popular at this time either. So they they needed uh, to show that this campaign uh, could be won. Um, and so when he comes to Drogheda, um, as they always do, they they offer um, terms. The terms are rejected, uh, and then they set about um, breaching the walls with their artillery. Uh, and once the breach is made, the the, the troops storm in. The first assault is beaten back out uh, and they suffer quite severe losses. So, I mean, there, there's a very, very tough fight uh, taking place here. And then with the, the second assault, it's Cromwell himself who leads his troops through the breach. And it's important to kind of stress that. I mean, Cromwell is no back, back, uh, you know, armchair general sitting at the back directing people. He's there leading from the front, uh, taking the same risks as his men. Uh, and of course, he, he famously, he, as he storms through the walls, he said that none in arms um, shall be shall be taken. That uh, everybody who is armed within the town uh, will, would be killed. Um, and so once they get in, a uh, horrible slaughter uh, begins to take place. The garrison of about 3,000, we know that about 2,500 of those are killed. Um, the reason we know it's 2,500, about 400 managed to slip over the north wall and escape, which is what I would have been doing as well once I saw the new model army coming in through the southern walls. Um, uh, but then really, I suppose, the controversy, Patrick, is over, over what happens then. Uh, in a storming of a town, the, the, the fact that the garrison was killed is, is not necessarily controversial in of itself, though I think the scale of it was quite exceptional. You're talking of thousands rather than hundreds. Uh, but uh, as well as that, it's a question of, of, of whether uh, civilians were killed as well. And this has been something that's exercised uh, historians a lot over the, over the past centuries. But uh, I, I tended to go to Cromwell's own account of, of this uh, event, and he makes it very clear uh, that civilians were killed um, during the storming of Drogheda. He doesn't give numbers. They weren't interested in numbers of civilians. They, they really want to know how many of the enemy were killed in terms of, of soldiers. Um, but he does say that, that the, the dead included many inhabitants. Um, so uh, we do know that, that civilians die. And it's really this combination of the large-scale killing of the garrison in addition to the killing of civilians that, that really shocks contemporary opinion as well. It's not just simply here we are three or four hundred years later looking back and being horrified. Uh, opinion at the time uh, was, was equally shocked by what took place. And word of this spreads right throughout Europe very, very quickly. We know that it, within two two and a half weeks it's reached Paris it then moves on down to Rome I mean it spreads very quickly this is something 
extremely significant and was recognised as such at the time. Because, John, your comparison with Hiroshima is an interesting one because the bomb was dropped to bring an end to the war, to, yeah. to I suppose, make a point to the Japanese that they, they shouldn't continue with the war and make a point to the Russians. And in the same way, Cromwell tried to justify this by saying that it would save lives in the long run, yeah, it would terrify the others into immediately surrendering. That's exactly the point. He says it's a righteous judgment of God, and then he says, and it will prevent the effusion of blood for the future. It was very, very important to him that if towns surrendered, um, he honoured the terms to the letter. Uh, there, was, there was a very bad uh, record in Ireland for, uh, for all parties of taking surrenders and then, and then um, taking uh, vengeance w- when they promised they wouldn't. So for Cromwell, it was really important that if towns surrendered, they were given generous terms and he honoured them. If they didn't surrender, then they, he'd make an example of them. And so he is determined to make an example in um, Drogheda. That, I mean, uh, Cromwell, in, his, in the letter he writes to the Speaker of the House of Commons, doesn't put a figure on the number killed, or he, put, he gives rough figures. But his chaplain published a very, very short little pamphlet which puts an exact figure on it, and he must have buried them. And he says it's 3,524. Now, from what we know pretty reliably about the size of the garrison and what we know about the fact that when people who locked themselves into towers and turrets um, and subsequently surrendered uh, on mercy, that's say they surrendered, leaving Cromwell to decide what to do with them, um, he would execute the officers in cold blood. He would execute the, any uh, clergy that were there in cold blood or friars. And then he would execute one in ten of the common soldiers and the other nine would be sent uh, as indentured servants, effectively as slaves, to the West Indies. So we can do calculations on that, and we can see as a result of that there must have been somewhere in the range of seven to 800 civilians killed. Uh, the maths don't make any sense otherwise. What I would say is that there is very little evidence of civilians being killed in cold blood. There's, there's my, my own strong feeling is that as his troops storm through the town, they don't stop and ask somebody if they're combatants or if they, even if they haven't got weapons. If, if they come across them as they clear the town, the first reaction of a professional soldier is to kill anyone who might be a threat. I think a lot of civilians get caught up, as it were, in that way. When it comes to killing executions in cold blood, um, then Cromwell is much more selective and he is determined to execute, I say, all the officers, anyone who is associated with the Catholic Church as a priest or a friar, and then the uh, common soldiers are, 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 examples are made, but others are spared. But there's no evidence of cold blood killing of civilians. Except for, uh, uh, sorry, Eamon, yeah? If I could in there for a minute, and I think quite rightly that uh, Neil and, and, and John have, you know, quite rightly, rightly um, I suppose, um, focused on how quickly, how important these two um, um, key events, the storming of Drogheda and Wexford are, and how they very quickly, you know, word of, uh, word of them spreads very quickly to the continent. But I think it's also important to see the Cromwellian conquest, as Michal said at the outset, as part of, you know, an 11-year war, as the Irish poet um, Shen O'Connell um, dubbed it on Kogu Dochrikni era, the war that finished Ireland. And if you look at the Irish if you look at the Irish language record, looking at uh, specifically at probably one of the most important and less used sources for the history of of the 17th century, them five wonderful narrative poems edited by Cecilia O'Reilly in the 1950s, Cromwell is seen as as a as as one of a rogues gallery of English. Um, and indeed Irish parliamentary generals, people like Sir Charles Coote, um, John Michael um, Jones, um, Ayrton, his son-in-law, um, uh, Fleetwood Ludlow. And it's only really in, in the... In the in the 1650s, or sorry, in the in the 1660s, 1670s, that he ascends, if you like, um, the pantheon, or if you like, the the rogues gallery. If you look at at 18th century poetry, you know po- poets like um, the the you know the the Ulster poets, uh, Padro Dornin and E. Uh, um, e. Mac- e- Art McCoy, 
you know, they see the Cromwellian conquest and they see Cromwell as one of these monsters of Irish history going back to the Viking Turgesius, to Dermot MacMorrow, to Henry and Elizabeth, Cromwell and King Billy. So it's, 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 it's fascinating that in the historical record, you know, the contemporary Irish literary tradition is one of a group. He hasn't emerged as this you know, key, if you like, um, you know, diabolical figure that he would become in the later 17th and the 18th century. And 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 that's and Michal, that's very interesting. And again, going back to something that John said about the those that died in in, in Drogheda, we have civilians perhaps killed not in cold blood but in in hot blood uh, during the conflict. You have then the the, the 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 regiments and 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 the soldiers. But the Catholics, the Catholic priests in the middle, I would have seen them as civilians. And the fact that they're being taken out and and is that is that not a, a sign of of religious bigotry or am i not un- understanding it in the context of the time well, well i think a couple of things patrick first of all that the um catholic priests were were um uh, seen in england as being very much a uh, part of the rebellion that they had instigated it, that they had encouraged people to kill uh, protestant settlers uh, back in 1641 42 uh, and uh, as uh, it, the depositions there is some evidence uh, from the depositions um, of, of those sort of accusations being made. So in a sense they were seen as very much part of it and therefore you know they had blood on their hands as well. Uh, so from that point of view they, they were seen as, as fair game. But also uh, in some ways you know Cromwell, his views on the Catholic Church, uh, you know I mean I think most famously he said that you know he wouldn't meddle with any man's conscience and said you could believe whatever you wanted inside your own head. But uh, he was absolutely bitterly hostile to the Catholic Church uh, and, and its clergy. And and therefore, he saw them as in league with the Antichrist, uh, and therefore they had to be eradicated. So it was very much in, in keeping with his his you know, religious world view, if you like. Uh, and therefore, he he made no bones about this, and he was he was quite proud uh, of of everywhere he went during those early months. Of that, anywhere they any time they got their hands on Catholic clergy, as he says himself, they were knocked on the head. Um, so they were they were simply killed outright. So Drogheda is really just the first the first of of many of these killings of clergy you get throughout throughout his nine months in Ireland. Yeah, it's worth saying that he's actually violently anti-clerical. I mean, he thinks the clergy everywhere uh, rip the people off and they uh, they mislead them. They, so in Scotland, he uses the same phrase uh, that he'd used to the Catholic clergy in, in, a, in, a, in a, um, a declaration he issued to the clergy, get method, Clon McNoy's. Um, he, uh, he says to the Irish clergy, yours is a co- covenant with death and hell. And he says to the Scottish Presbyterian clergy, yours may be a covenant with death and hell, which seems to me to be pretty much the same thing. And he accuses the Presbyterian clergy in Scotland of vomiting over the altars of the Lord. But, uh, he said the, the, in the Old Testament, um, the prophets of Baal had vomited over the altars of the Lord because they were drunk. And in Scotland, they vomited over the altars of the Lord because they were drunk with power. So he is violently anti-clerical. He wants to free people from uh, t- the tyrannies he wants to free them from, include the tyrannies of clergy. However, he doesn't, it is truth, he doesn't, uh, he doesn't routinely kill uh, Presbyterian ministers in Scotland, but he is determined to destroy their power. And I do think that it's important that he had read the very tendentious accounts of the rebellion in 1641, which, which uniformly say that the, the popular rebellion was instigated by the Catholic clergy. Now, what we found in the 1641 depositions is a much more nuanced position. We found a lot of the Catholic clergy trying to restrain the violence, and I can think of one in particular where, where a Protestant who, who, who knows the that the, the mob is coming to uh, steal all his goods and take everything away from him, and he rushes with his valuables and and um, asks the cat, local Catholic police to look after them for him uh, as being the most trustworthy man around. But Cromwell didn't know that. Cromwell only knew that that uh, what what he believed to have been he, he, in tremendous massacres had been instigated by a campaign by the Catholic clergy, um, you know, or organised by their bishops and archbishops. Okay, well, you're listening to Talking History on News Talk and lots of great texts coming in on 53106. Sean O'Wexford says that whatever about uh, views of him elsewhere in Wexford, Cromwell is a war criminal. And Sean there in Wexford is enjoying the show. And after the break, we'll be finding out exactly what happened in Wexford. We'll also be finding out about some defeats Cromwell had in Ireland. And we'll be finding out whether, in fact, it's true that he picked up malaria in Ireland and whether that was what killed him in the end. So stay with us on News Talk.
Talking History with Patrick Gagan. Thanks to irishnewspaperarchives.com. History online and in your library. On News Talk 106 to 108. Well, welcome back to Talking History. Tonight we're looking at the story of Cromwell in Ireland with Dr. Michal Shukru, Professor John Morrell, Dr. Eamon O'Kira. We're now delighted to be joined by Senator Joe Toole, who's been an independent member of Shannon Aaron, representing the NUI constituency since 1987. He's also a former president of the Irish Congress of Trade Unions and he served as General Secretary of the INTO. But first, Michal, I think you had a question for John. Yeah, John, I mean, it's, I just say the, the analogy you draw with the, the atomic bombs in Japan is a very interesting one. But uh, And again, the reason, if you like, that uh, Cromwell hoped by acting very severely in Drogheda that that would discourage uh, further acts of resistance uh, throughout the country. But as with uh, Nagasaki, why Wexford? Well, of course, I think Wexford is different. I, I, the, that analogy I made is false. Uh, I now withdraw it in this sense. <laughs> but uh, Wexford, he intended to use it as his winter headquarters, and um, the sacking of Wexford was a disaster from his point of view. And it, was, it was a result of indiscipline of his troops getting out of control. Um, the, there was a negotiation that hadn't been completed. There'd been a long, drawn-out negotiation, and uh, David Sinnott, the um, governor, was trying to uh, spin out negotiations. Um, there's, a, there's a fort on the edge of Wexford which, which separate, separately surrenders, and Cromwell's troops take over the fort. And then they discover that the defenders of the town itself are withdrawing from the walls. Um, that, that brought the two together. So his men just stormed in, took the opportunity and stormed in, and, and then they lost control. And the, and the fact that Cromwell doesn't write a detailed report from Wexford in the way he does from most of his other major um, uh, actions, I think is because he's rather ashamed that he'd lost control and the town which he'd wanted to keep for the, for the winter uh, is lost to him. However, he does subsequently try to use it in a Nagasaki way. I, he does use it to reinforce his case that if you surrender, if you don't hang about ne- negotiating and uh, trying to get impossible terms, that if you if you do surrender on the kind of terms that he thinks are reasonable, you will your lives will be spared and you will be and your property will be secured from from looting. But the, uh, the, the so he has to spin on Wexford that it, that Sinnott wasn't negotiating seriously. He was spinning out negotiations while reinforcements arrived. But uh, so. The, the parallel of Nagasaki is actually rather imprecise because um, in, in the end he would have preferred not to have to do it there. But he was willing to do a second one if that's what it took to get the, uh, the quick surrenders that he, that he needed. Again, I think to set, just develop a point I think you made earlier on, it's very, very important that Cromwell is very, very nervous that the political will to pour resources into Ireland, um, uh, he wasn't confident the political will was there. He had to make this a very short, sharp campaign. Otherwise he'd find that his supply lines were being um, cut back and that the Parliament was saying you've got to do more with less resources. I mean, a typical politician's response. And um, so he, he is determined to keep the, uh, the pressure up so that Parliament can see that by pouring resources in, this will be a campaign that's over within a, within a short time. But, but I mean, of course, ironically, John, I mean, the, the exact opposite happens. And, and if that is the intent, which is to have a, a short shark shop, a you know, short campaign, it, it backfires spectacularly because, as we know, the war drags on for four years. Yeah. And, and very much it seems as if the, the sort of atrocities at Drogheda and Wexford actually stiffen resistance as people say, well, you know, if this is how he's going to behave towards us, well, then we best fight on uh, and, and, and make the best that we can for ourselves. Well, um, I'm not and, sure. I think that we might actually finally disagree um, because I... I, I I think that, uh, I mean, 28 towns do surrender to him in that nine-month period. And by the time he leaves, the, uh, the, the whole of the east um, and almost all the south has been, has been completely occupied. And certainly most of the census population have been occupied. Now, it does indeed take a longer time than anyone would have wanted to grind down Limerick and, and, and Galway. But, uh, you know, he had made, for, I mean, what he achieves in nine months is an awful lot more than any English commander for many centuries had achieved. I mean, well, if you could, if you maybe um, 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 roll on uh, um, uh, for years to, um, to, to 1691, um, you could say that, you know, King Billy had a similar 
um, f- phenomenal success. Like Cromwell, he hadn't taken Limerick and he hadn't taken Galway, but he leaves and, you know, the war drags on. Yeah. And I think, I think, um, the, the manner in which they, uh, you know, uh, once, once the last, if you like, um, army had been, uh, Irish army had been defeated in the field at Scarif Hollis and the last um, garrisons had surrendered. The, the 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 manner in which they allowed thousands and thousands of demobilised men to leave Ireland, you know, was I suppose p- part of the the traditional English fear of a Tory war that you know you were going to have these demobilised soldiers, you know, who were on their keeping, so to speak, in the in the woods and bogs and mountains. Yeah. And there's no question that they did. Um, have a have a you know have a major impact on you know the 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 the, the progress with with um so with the plantation and with actually um getting these lands that the adventurers and the servitors had had won you know had, or you know I found myself understanding what happened in Ireland in the 1650s but made much clearer to me by watching what's happening in Afghanistan now. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, the, uh, the England, English army arrives with massively superior technology. I mean, the best field artillery that ever been in Ireland and so on. It, uh, it can destroy reasonably quickly the organized armies of the, of the Catholic Confederation. But it can't win a, a guerrilla war against the people mm-hmm. who take to the, the, the bogs and the woods, the uh- Tories, the woodkern. And that becomes an unwinnable war over the next nine years. So, you know, you can, you can, you can disperse the organized enemy me, but you can't begin to uh, get overall control of, of a, an enemy that's just, that just melts away before you. And the letters of the English soldiers left in Ireland um, after Cromwell departs is one of increasing despair of how on earth are you going to deal with the, with the Tory problem. And it's exactly the same as you hear from our military commanders in, in, Af- in uh, Afghanistan now. And the answer, of course, is exactly the same. You deal with them. You know, you, you make, make arrangements with them. So you hear people in Afghanistan saying, we've got yeah. to find the more reasonable of the Taliban and deal with them. It was exactly the same in the 1650s. And Senator Joe Toole, I think this is a perfect opportunity to bring you into the discussion because I'd be curious to know what you make of, of Cromwell because when we did this a show like this four and a half years ago, we were over overwhelmed with texts that were hostile to Cromwell. But tonight, I don't know, there's a certain number of people like Colin and Nace suggesting that maybe we should have sided with Cromwell and got a republic earlier. Some who who recognize what he did in terms of of British history and and, and then others who, again, hostile because of of, of the atrocities at Drogheda and Wexford. So, so it's it's interesting. I mean, I come back to the bit about getting a republic earlier because I think that's the kicking off point. But in terms of of, of, of how it ties in uh, with modern politics. Like, uh, effectively, uh, Drogheda was literally our 9-11. It was on the 11th of September uh, that, the, uh, the, that he, he took Drogheda at that time. You know? And uh, I suppose the other great connection, which I remember meeting John Major once, and I pointed out to him that he was the direct parliament, parliamentary uh, su- successor to Cromwell because he represented the same constituency of, of Huntingdon, in fact, at that stage. You know? But I think the, 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 the earlier text that you received in there, particularly the one from Wexford, uh, this idea of uh, making some comparison between uh, Cromwell's so-called republic and a modern republic is absolutely outrageous. I mean, if, if this had this was the, the absolute antithesis to the um, republican princes, uh, principles of tone, for instance, of Catholic, Protestant, and dissenter together, and uh, the, the fact that. Uh, the, the fact that, that um, Cromwell may have got away with murder in the literal sense, he has also got away uh, with being uh, referred to as a parliamentarian of note, an intellectual of note, and a person in favour of Commonwealth. I mean, it's absolutely clear there was no aspect of uh, support for Commonwealth in his uh, approach to, uh, to the world at large. In fact, his only uh, indication of tolerance was towards uh, the, the broad Protestant sect. I mean, he he did allow for um, t- 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 different sects within Protestantism. But I mean, in, in point of fact, I'd like let's be absolutely clear about it that uh, in in modern times, and that's the you know the people who are saying we should look at him more benignly are looking at it from a modern point of view. But if we want to do that in modern terms, I mean, he was an absolute racist. I mean, uh, what he did was effectively genocidal. It was 
ethnic cleansing, and by his own words, in fact, you know, uh, you could call it nothing else, uh, only that. But I, but but above all, uh, and I mean the things that he did, uh, and it's quite true. It's hard to uh, come to terms or come to a conclusion on the exact figures and stats, statistics, etc. About people who were killed, etc. I mean, even in, I think it would have to be accepted that in in Drogheda, man, many of the people who fought against him in Drogheda were actually royalists. But uh, I, I think it's also fair to say that he did uh, support and uh, and and, and uh, allowed the kidnapping and exportation of thousands of women and children. So, I mean, the things that he did uh, in, in a modern context were, were, were outrageous. And there's no doubt about it that, uh, like, parliamentarians to this day would still see uh, that he would have um, maintained an impact and an influence on the course of Irish politics to the centuries afterwards. I mean, you, you could say, uh, well, it's easy enough to say that following, um, uh, following Cromwell and the particular act of, of Parliament that he brought into being around that time, uh, it meant that, in fact, the, the ownership of land after the Act of Settlement, for instance, uh, was, was almost denied to Catholics. And uh, if you then kind of fast forward, uh, you know, the, the, the centuries uh, to the let's say even to the famine, the fact that Irish people didn't own the land at that time uh, made exacerbated completely the impact of the famine. You could also say that the plantation, or you, you probably you, we can't blame him completely for the plantation of Ulster, but the, the whole uh, issue of the plantation of Ulster and the, the impact that has created, I mean, you, can, you could follow it, you could trace it right down to partition. You know, it's a, okay, I mean, I, I'm slightly over the top here in what I'm saying, but I'm just trying to, like, in simple terms, see, well, how I see it as a kind of modern uh, parliamentarian uh, and uh, w- without being a, a, a historian, to see how I see the, he, the thread of Cromwell running through uh, the, uh, the, 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 the centuries since then. And I see no, nothing whatever positive in it. Oh. Or nothing, else, nothing that we could have grasped or nothing that we could have joined or uh, approved, you know? Oh, well, you've definitely come on the show and stirred this up. And David, <laughs> David, David is agreeing with you. He's saying that, uh, here, here to the Senator, Cromwell was a bigot, a racist and a criminal. Uh, Professor John Morrill, what about, what about that, what Senator Joe Toole had to say? Well, my, my problem with that is that it, uh, by uh, focusing blame on Cromwell, you let a lot of other English people off the hook. I mean, <laughs> well, I mean he's, he's nine years old when the um, Ulster Plantation takes place, so he's not at all responsible for it. But of course, it, it's part of an English mindset. That, that he uh, brings to Ireland. So, you know, it's part, I want to blame the English much more generally. I mean, I don't want to exonerate the English for what happened in the mid-17th century in Ireland, and I don't want to exonerate the English for something I think is much worse than what happened at Drogheda and Wexford, which is the uh, confiscation of half of the land of Ireland yes, and indeed. its redistribution, you know, to Protestants um, in the second half of the 1650s. Um, as it happens, I think Cromwell opposed the severity of that policy and wanted a, a more mild policy. But that doesn't that's not to exonerate, you know, many other English people who push who push past him to achieve it. So my worry is that, that if we're not careful, we will blame Cromwell so much that we won't blame um, uh, a much wider problem in the English mind. But none um, of which, 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 which continued yeah. for centuries. I might actually so, get Michal in on this as okay. well. And Michal, there's also some interesting texts about uh, some defeats that Cromwell had. Sh- Sean in Cork says that is it not a bit of a myth that Cromwell was a great general when he came up against Dove O'Neill's forces? He got a right beating, so that he was a man of sheer force rather than skill. I, mean, I think certainly militarily, um, that we can maybe overstate the case about Cromwell's Cromwell's genius. I mean, he he was a very forceful uh, general. Clearly, he had uh, simply one plan, which was a full. full frontal assault uh, and when that failed he didn't really have a plan B and, and it, 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 it fails most spectacularly at Clonmel uh, in May 1650 just weeks before his departure and, and he suffers huge losses uh, running into thousands much more than he ever suffered in the English Civil War so when he's up against experienced uh, soldiers officers who know what they're doing you know he, 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 can, he can come a cropper as he did at Clonmel so I mean I, I think let's not over or build him up to one as a, this amazing general uh, I mean he, he had his strengths but he had his weaknesses 
losses as well. But just to come back... Yeah, let's get you involved in the real fight <laughs> that's going on. Just to come back to this point, because I, I think the point that John is making, I think it's an important one to say we shouldn't focus everything, and clearly Cromwell isn't responsible for everything that went on in the 17th century. But at the same time, I, I think that, uh, you know, clearly as commander-in-chief of the forces uh, that was there, and also then effectively uh, as military dictator from much of the 1650s, the responsibility for what happens is must be laid at his door. I mean, we cannot just walk away uh, and say, well, hold a sec, it's part of a broader mindset, you know, this, this is clearly a bigger problem with English society, which I absolutely agree with John, it was, but the man who was actually directing this policy and the man who ultimately is responsible for it, be that he may have had some reservations about aspects of it, is Oliver Cromwell. And I'm afraid, you know, even by modern standards, you know, the, the blame will be laid at his door. I mean, he is, he is, he's in charge. He has to accept responsibility. And let's be clear, let's be clear also that the, the land grab, and I, I, and I agree with John in terms that it's not about letting other people off the hook, but I mean, the land grab, the taking of the land from the Catholic landowners was effectively to pay off uh, his army. Like, that was, that, was, that was one of the prime motivations, and he must have been involved in that. Uh, there, there, there is uh, obviously uh, a wider uh, level of responsibility, but in terms of the key figure and the, the yeah. person who will accept responsibility, if not complete accountability, has to be uh, Cromwell in that regard. And I, I, I see it probably that in, in, that, in that particular way. I mean, uh, the fact that there was no element of tolerance about him uh, is, uh, is hugely important. And I think it, it is hugely important to, 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 um, but to nail the lie about him being in some way a Republican. Or, uh, I mean, he's, he's, he's clearly he, anything that was not a kingdom or run by, uh, by a rival was a republic. That was his central view yeah, to that. I, I think almost sorry, we should have... I could, if sorry, I could Eamon. step in there. Um, the other thing I think is important to nail the lay on is this idea that um, mainly as a, as a result of, the, uh, of, of a sort of a satirical eulogy to Cromwell in... in um, the, the, the famous satir- satirical work in um, Parliament, Clinia Thomas, where Cromwell is revered, you know, Treshalata Cromwell, oh, a re chronic scholar, God be with you, Cromwell, who, who, who established every chorl and upstart. This idea that um, Cromwell in some way was, um, you know, a sort of <laughs> a 17th century sort of, you know, working class hero or something. And, and people have latched on to what is a satirical work to, to suggest that Cromwell was in some way responsible for breaking down, um, you know, barriers and enabling um, what the, the, the Ulster poet um, Art McCoy called the body in the horn of the chores of the barley, these Irish people who from the 16th century Gaelic Irish people had been, you know, speaking English, you know, smoking pipes, wearing swords and aping the mannerisms of, of the English um, conqueror. Yeah. And this satirical eulogy to, to Cromwell has been latched, has been has been seized upon by a couple of scholars to actually suggest that Cromwell is is is, is, is a hero in 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 some, if you like. Yeah. Okay, well, we're, yeah, almo- we're, almost yeah. out of, we're almost out of time, but I'll just uh, go with some more text. Um, Raven Dublin says that uh, no one ever mentions the atrocities against the native Irish population, which allowed Protestant settlers to take their lands and which led to the uprising in 1641. Yeah. There were no depositions from them. Uh, someone else, Garton Canmare, says, Good man, Joe Toole, Cromwell was a lunatic and a zealot. And then Des and Cork is even further to say Cromwell was a psycho e- equal to Hitler. So, John, I'm, we're almost out of time, but if I was to leave the last word to you about... Well, in a way, we should have almost have skipped the, the kind of the context part of the debate and just got straight to the fight about, yeah. about, about, I'll have a, but how, how should we see Cromwell then? Is he, uh, is he still this great villain in Irish history, clearly from some of these texts? And, and is it right that we see him given all that we've discussed in this hour? Well, I, I think he should be seen as a villain because there was nothing remotely on the scale of Drogheda anywhere else by anybody else. So, mm-hmm. you know, it does stand out. But, it, but he is not the villain in the sense I think there are lots of other people who are more culpable. We haven't had a chance to say that he actually was sacked as Lord Lieutenant of Ireland by the uh, Parliament because he opposed the Act of Settlement, the Settlement, the Act, which, you know, has to Helen Connaught as its consequence. He, uh, he did want to confiscate Irish land uh, to compensate those who'd 
invested in the conquest, but he didn't want to have uh, ethnic cleansing. So he's a, a villain, but he's not the villain. <laughs> and, and you suggested earlier that he, he also wanted to extend liberty to Ireland. Yeah. Oh. He makes it very plain he will not force anyone to act against their conscience. No one will be forced to attend any religious service they don't want to do. And actually, although it's a very silly thing to say to a Catholic, um, he says, you know, if you want to practice in private your Catholic faith, that's fine. Though I'm not going to let you have these priests who will only lead you into further rebellion. A- a- elsewhere, Cromwell gives a great deal of freedom to Catholics. In Maryland, he actually sends boats to reinstate Catholic authority because the Catholics there had been suppressed by, by Puritans after they'd shown they could live in peace with their neighbours. By their fruits you shall know them. He believed, I think largely wrongly, that the Catholic priests had instigated the massacres of 1641 and he wasn't going to forgive them for that. I'm afraid we are, have just run over time, so we'll leave it there. I will thank all my guests, uh, Michal Shukru, Joe O'Toole, John Morrill, Nemo Kira, after the news. Uh, we will be back with more texts after the news and I'll wrap up this Cromwell discussion but thanks to everyone next week George Bernard Shaw and we're back with more after the news Talking History with Patrick Gagan Thanks to irishnewspaperarchives.com History Online and in your library Thanks for listening to this News Talk 106 to 108 podcast To download other programmes or for more information go to newstalk.ie 